Today, the institute still has the distinction of being the only one of its kind in India and one of only a handful in the entire Asia Pacific region. We are indeed proud to have here with us this morning Professor Ashutosh Sharma, Secretary, Department of Science and Technology and Ministry of Earth Science, as our chief guest. We have Dr. Shekhar Chintamani Mande, Secretary, Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, and our respected Director General of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, New Delhi, to preside over the occasion. We have Dr. Suman Kumari Mishra, Director, CSIR, CGCRI, Dr. Dipayan Sanyal, the senior most scientist of the Institute, and Mr. Siddharth De, administrative officer of the Institute. And also, we have the entire gamut of our scientists, starting from our past respected directors, members of research council, chairperson research council, our technical officers, administrative officials, and the support staffs rejoicing the event. I, on behalf of the organizing committee, would like to welcome you once again to this auspicious occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, there's a humble submission from my side. Kindly keep your device microphones muted, please. Thank you. May I now request Dr. Suman Kumari Mishra, Director CSIR CGCRI, to give a welcome address, please. Thank you, Sumana. Very good morning to all of you. Respected dignitaries, member at the virtual dais of today, Professor Sharma, Dr. Mande, Dr. Sanya, Mr. Day, guests from other institutions who have joined with us virtually, research council members, past directors, my colleagues from CSIR, CGCRI, my dear students, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to welcome you all to the 71st Foundation Day celebration of CSIR, CGCRI. It is a great privilege to have with us Professor Ashutosh Sharma, Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India, as a chief guest and speaker for the Atma Ram Memorial Lecture. Thank you, sir. There could have been no better person to preside over the program than our beloved Director General and Secretary DSIR, Government of India, Dr. Shekhar Simande. I welcome both of you, sir, today on behalf of the Institute. The Central Glass and Ceramic Research Institute has a special place within the CSIR, as it happens to be among the first four laboratories to be established under the CS Council. It began on 26 August 1950 as a central glass and silicate research institute, which metamorphosed to what we see today as central glass and ceramic research institute. It started research from clay to mineral beneficiation and later progressed into developing quality glass and ceramics that is application in multiple industries domains such as communications, energy, defense, atomic energy, space, water, healthcare, and so on. Currently, our research domains are spread out across eight major areas, namely advanced ceramics, specialty glass, fiber optics and photonics, functional materials, refractories and traditional ceramics, energy materials, membrane separation technologies, technologies and bioceramics. Research in the Institute has generated a robust portfolio of patents, about 75 presently in force across various in countries, and a very large number of publications. Roughly, CGCRI adds 160 publications per year in reputed SCI journals. The Institute is also a part of the ACSIR, offering interdisciplinary and very high skilled manpower in advanced glass and ceramics at master's and doctoral level. Besides, many other IIT and universities are also attached with CGCRI for these degrees. Societal connects for the institute are effectively front-ended through our two outreach centers at Khurja in Uttar Pradesh and Naroda in Gujarat. While the institute is known for its seminal contributions in defense and atomic energy sectors, as also some of the manufacturing sectors, CSIR CGCRI has made a substantial foray into healthcare, energy, environment, and rural sectors. We are among the pioneers in CSIR to develop affordable medical implants for knee joints, hip joints, and others. CSIR, CGCRI have a scientific partner, and it is diverse from DRDO, DAE, and ISRO. Several major industries and public sector units, such as Tata Steel, NTPC, ONGC, Prism Johnson, 
ITC, HA, BHEL, BEL, to name a few. Apart from this, other stakeholders are Railways, Ministry of Sistry, Ministry of Mines. We have partnership with the state governments such as those of West Bengal, Jharkhand, Gujarat, and Uttar Pradesh. Research activities and technologies developed of CGCRI during the year had aligned with us during the years aligned with, with as many as nine substantial development goals, SDGs, such as good health and well-being, clean water, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation, infrastructure, reduced inequalities, and responsible consumption patterns. In addition, the HRD and teaching training activities align well with the quality education goal while collaborating with various stakeholders. While a total of roughly 24 technological areas and four institutional programs contributed to the SDGs, 14 of its technological areas could be mapped against the national missions, particularly in Make in India, about seven initiatives, seven programs, Skill India, Swaksh Bharat, and Smart City. We have a, as an institute, there has a core competence in the material science and engineering, CSIR, CGCRA is always geared to align and transform itself in the evolving trends. In line with such approach, we are envisaging entry into several upcoming national R&D programs. One of the very important one is National Hydrogen Mission. CSIR, CGCRA has been involved in technology-oriented R&D in the area of alternate energy for generation, conversion, and storage of electrical energy for long and have appropriate knowledge base and expertise in the area of solid oxide fuel cell, electrolyzer cell, photochemical and photocatalytic water spilling for hydrogen generation. Recently, several important programs have been planned by the Institute with active participation from industry for ultimate demonstrations of these products to be developed through DST program on advanced hydrogen and fuel cell, HHFC 2021 announced by Department of Science and Technology and CSI Hydrogen Mission. Another place where we are going to get involved, which is important, is the LIGO Consortium. The LIGO Consortium, which is for the development and regular operation of an advanced interferometry gravitational wave detector in India, needs enhancement in case of system, such as laser, suspension, seismic isolation, and test mass. CSIR, CGCRI on this advanced LIGO program, based on its established expertise on the five villages, for different industries is at very advanced stage in discussion with Ayuka Pune and LIGO Caritech USA team to be the part of the collaborative research on power scaling of laser at two micron wavelength for advanced LIGO system. In another development, CDCRI has started in the healthcare sector, newer, which is long standing issues related to chronic wounds and deep burns through innovative synthetic and biogenic dressing materials cartilage repair, and regeneration for spine, hip, and knee degeneration, using novel nanofiber patches and non-invasive physical stimuli approaches. These areas have strong applications and commercial potential globally. We are, as institute, is poised to establish a center of excellence on bioceramics, biomaterials, and implants in collaboration with Tata New Materials and TIFAR. This proposal is at very high advanced stage of review at TIFAR. Thulium laser developed at CTCRI is going to be launched very soon with BioRed Medicis Private Limited Pune for lithotripsy and other medical diagnosis. Our FBG greeting sensors has shown a very promising result in pantograph applications and are supposed to be tested in real situation in experimental test buggy by railways in our ongoing collaboration. The last one year had been impeded by the pandemic during this time, however, we license the technology for UV sanitization system for office documents to an, to an industry partner of Assam, and this is being also used at different places at our office. Close to 200 research publications have been made in this pandemic period up to July and uh, in SCI journals, and around 16 patents have been filed and granted during this period. Negotiation and procedural mechanisms are in progress to secure some key projects in energy, advanced ceramics, and glasses, Eight students have obtained their PhD degree in this time, and uh, about 16 crore was the external cash flow. Despite the, pandem despite the pandemic, we organized more than 20 other events, conferences, and lectures 
one such major event was icg cgcri tutorial which were in january 2021 where several international participants were involved the excellent lectures that were delivered by leading scientists in the field are now being documented to for the further greater disseminations cgcr cgcri as a particular leader of ceramic and glass in forum thing of csir conducted more than 9 years to meet online with leading industries pan csir in april 2021 at different times several possibilities of technology development and transfer could be narrowed down further crystallizing on those points are in progress this year's national technology day was graced by the secretary of trdo and has heralded a new vista in the institute's collaborative collaborative research in the defense sector beside we are already with them in many programs several online student connect program through the csr jigyasa initiative had also been hallmark to the institute commitment to outreach among the numerous research initiative a unique west to wealth initiative focusing development of biogenically derived biomaterials from animal waste such as fish scale corals to generate calcium phosphate based ceramics is worth mentioning especially especially reflective coating on the radiation shielding glass was developed which gave much higher radiation shielding and it was duly appreciated by department of atomic energy hydrogen generation through soec and photoelectric chemical cells has been pursued to realize a sustainable low carbon economy in another development and method of non invasive detection and monitoring of diabetes through wrist sensor has been successfully developed during this period a new a newer version of rsw glass melting technology using refractory crucible for higher scale development of larger size glass blocks for high power lasers glass sign ad remo uh, radome rbsn made of rbsn for defense application thermal barrier coating turbine application and and the chalcogenide glasses are the some of the major initiative they progress well in research many newer projects in the leading area has also started with the csir funding and other research funding some of them to mention are the pulse laser pulse field laser sources for additive manufacturing low temperature sensing devices piezoelectric coefficient composites fbg long gauge sensor ultra low expansion glass and ceramics to name a few the institute commitment the institute commitment in contact connecting with so out to center through various skill development and rural capacity building initiatives apart from the invigorating common facility centers at facilities in clusters a project was establishing a digital academy of terracotta was undertaken the csir jigyasa program attained new heights through the establishment of jigyasa virtual laboratory that housed experimental modules in area of such as water testing replacement of products of household use and so on academic linkages were established with weltech institute and the msrd kanpur for collaborating r and collaborative r and d an industrial linkage for technology development and commercialization was established with sfo technologies in the international cooperation front the institute entered into an agreement to supply specialty optics fiber for the development to the multimedia university malaysia and also partnered in an indo north region project on water in terms of facility creation two major facility creation is almost completed or going to complete are the ultra clean room facility for the large size neodymium doped laser glasses and specialty optical glasses the support of department of atomic energy and the isro is duly acknowledged now i am coming to the atmaram memorial lecture dr atmaram apadam shri was born in 1908 and received his education from Allahabad University obtaining his dsc degree in 1936 he made a very significant contribution in the to the understanding of the mechanism of photochemical reactions dr atmaram despite being a noted scientist with numerous publication and patents excelled in his institution building role too he belonged to the core team of the shanti swarup bhatnagar that worked for the creation of csir he was assigned the task to establish an institute of glass and ceramics in calcutta which he did with great success that is why we all are all have assembled today here because of his effort he was our founder director and he remained as director till assuming the responsibility of his uh, since its inception and 
He remained as director till assuming a responsibility of Secretary to the Government of India and Director General CSIR in 1966. Being a part of several policy bodies of the government, he also served as the principal advisor to the Prime Minister in Science and Technology. He was the first recipient of Sadhanti Swaro Patnagar Prize of India. As a mark of honor to this great scientific leader and other founder director, CSIR CGCRA instituted Atma Gandhi Memorial Lecture in the year 2000. The first lecture was delivered by Dr. Ari Masilkar. Several eminent personalities delivered the lectures over the years. The institute is fortunate that on the 71st Foundation Day, that is today, the 18th Ram, uh, 18th Atma Ram Memorial Lecture would be delivered by Professor Ashutosh Sharma. Thank you, Professor Sharma, once again for accept, accepting our invitation. Thank you, sir. I am very delighted and grateful that today's presidential address is by none other than our beloved head of the CSIR family, guide, mentor, Dr. Sekha Chintamani Mande, Director General CSIR and Secretary DSIR. Dr. Mande is a well-known structural and computational biologist, a PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, a former director of NCCS Pune Department of Biotechnology, fellow of all the national academies, winner of Santi Suru Patnagar Prize, HK Firodia Vigyan Bhushan Award 2020, and several other awards. Thank you, Sir Dr. Mante, for kind acceptance for giving today presidential address. Once again, thank you, Sir. With these few words, I again welcome you all today and look forward to the eliminating deliberation. Now, I request Dr. Mande for his presidential at this place. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Suman, for the very kind words of introduction. First of all, hearty felicitations to all of our CSI, CGCRI family on the 71st Foundation Day. Apnade Shabai Der, Achke Foundation Day, Shubhicha Evan Priti Janai. Uh, I have been to CTCRI uh, a few times and every time uh, I continue to be impressed with the quality of work that is done. And it so happens that uh, only yesterday I ran into Professor Indranil Manna, one of your former directors. And Professor Manna was very fondly recalling some of the things that CTCRI does, uh, the capacity or capability, which does not exist anywhere else in the country. None other academic organization or strategic institute or whatever has the same kind of capability as CGCRI in certain very niche areas. And Professor Manna and I were discussing how do we further promote it and how do we actually generate some quality man manpower trained in some of those areas. And we'll talk about that uh, in the coming time. But nonetheless, uh, delighted to hear that CGCRI is now celebrating 71st Foundation Day. You have had a very fantastic history with none other than Dr. Atmaram being the founder director. And we all remember Dr. Atmaram's uh, contributions to Indian science in general and to CSIR and to CGCRI in particular. And I'm so happy that on this day that you have found a very distinguished speaker, Professor Ashutosh Sharma, to deliver the Atmaram Memorial Lecture. I, continue, I look forward to continuously interacting with all of you and also to remain engaged in some of the future activities of CGCRI. And I will make it a point to come to CGCRI very soon. And at that time, we can also discuss some of the future issues that CGCRI may actually get into. Thank you all very much. And once again, felicitations to all of you. Back to you soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It's time now for the release of the CSIR CGCRI Research Highlights 2021 by our beloved Director General Sir. The Research Highlights 2021 provides an illustrative coverage of some of the key R&D progresses of the Institute during the past one year. It is meant for the cross-section of stakeholders interested to have an idea of the Institute's knowledge base that could be tapped and leveraged. Over to you, sir. I hope this is visible. 
Would one of you confirm it's visible? Yes, it is. Very yes, visible. yes, yes, very visible. In fact, research as CG CRI is also visible. And yes. also, again, click, sir. Again, click. Release. Release has to be clicked. Ah, uh, you have to click it uh, because you have the active control. Is it available now? Visible? Release? No, it disappeared now because you clicked on it. Let me. Sir, kindly share the screen. Then yes. Yeah. Uh, I shared a screen yeah. for some reason it disappeared. So what I want to do is I want to now. Share this one. Yes. OK. Is visible now? Key R&D yes. inputs and all? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. It's time now for the 18th Atmara Memorial Lecture to be delivered by Professor Sharma, the chief guest of the, uh, the program. Before we start the uh, lecture, I would request Dr. Dipayan Sanyal, the senior most scientist of this institute and head of Advanced Ceramic and Composite Division, to introduce our speaker formally to our audience, please. On behalf of CSR CGCRA family, I take great pleasure in extending a hearty welcome to our distinguished chief guest and speaker, Professor Ashutosh Sharma, who is a luminary and a visionary in the Indian SNT firmament. Professor Sharma is a secretary to the Government of India, Department of Science and Technology, Ministry of Science and Technology, and Secretary, Ministry of Art Sciences. Professor Sharma is an alumnus in chemical engineering from IIT Kanpur. He obtained his PhD from the State University of New York at Buffalo, USA. He was a professor at IIT Kanpur since 1997 and an institute chair professor since 2007 before taking charge as secretary DST at IIT Kanpur. Professor Sharma founded the new Nano Sciences Center and Advanced Imaging Center. Professor Sh Sharma is a multifaceted research personality with significant innovative contributions in a wide spectrum of interdisciplinary domains covering nanotechnology, thin films, nanocomposites, devices, nanofabrication, biomaterials, biosurfaces, and so on. He has published more than 350 research papers and has 15 patents to his credit. As Secretary DST, he has been instrumental in initiating several new programs related to capacity building, innovation, and startups, as well as prioritizing research in advanced manufacturing, waste processing, clean energy, and a national mission on cyber physical systems, and a very new program, advanced hydrogen and fuel cell, and so on. Professor Sharma is a fellow of all national academies in India. TWAS and the APAM. He is a winner of the prestigious Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, the TWAS Prize, the Infosys Prize, the Homi Bhava Award, among several others. Apart from SNT, his other interests are in the ancient history, philosophy, poetry, and art. I would now like to request Professor Sharma to deliver this 18th Atmaram Memorial Lecture on an interesting topic entitled Science and Scientists in the New Millennium, the Brave New World Challenges, Opportunities and Directions of SNT in the New Millennium. Professor Sharma, please. Uh, namaskar, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Sanyal. Um, I, I'm so delighted to see uh, uh, our great friend and the leader, um, Dr. Shekhar Mande, DGCSIR, and Secretary DSIR uh, with us. Um, 
uh, of course, Dr. Um, uh, Suman Kumari Mishra. She has been very proactive, uh, you know, for this lecture as well as I see many activities, very wide spectrum activities uh, which are going on in CGCRI that we heard about. Uh, what especially impressed me was it's a huge connect, very strong connect uh, with the larger ecosystem of science and technology in the country, uh, with the different labs of different ministries, with academia and with industry. Uh, I also am uh, happy to see some of the RC members and some of the other friends. I see Dr. Anjanre there, Dr. Murli Dharan. Uh, I'm sure there are very many others that I cannot see. Um, and I'm, I'm totally happy. I am really feel part of the family uh, of both CSIR and CGCRI in particular, because I have had the pleasure of uh, uh, being its uh, RC member um, I think it was last century or millennium or maybe the early part of this uh, century. I don't quite recall now, but what I do recall is a very vibrant nature uh, of the organization. Uh, indeed, very impressive, uh, very quality uh, scientists who are working with great dedication. Another great thing about uh, the Institute uh, is that it goes seamlessly from basic sciences to applied sciences, to technology, and in fact, delivering that technology uh, to all the stakeholders. So indeed, uh, it's a great privilege, it's a, a, a delight uh, to be with all of you uh, on this uh, occasion of 71st uh, Foundation Day uh, among the pioneering uh, CSIR labs. Um, and then, of course, um, Dr. Atma Ram, memorial lecture that we are here for, uh, that indeed we, we stand uh, under the banner of a very great scientist, uh, in fact, a holistic scientist. Uh, so it's, it's very different to be a scientist and excel in science, which is basically what we are here for as scientists. But at the same time, if there is nobody to take care of the processes of science and the structure of science and the leadership and the vision uh, that is required by scientific institutions, uh, then scientific excellence alone will not be able to flourish. Uh, so it is because of that reason uh, that we value Dr. Atmaram so much. Um, so it so happens that in last uh, last month or so, um, I had the pleasure of uh, giving a couple of memorial lectures. Um, uh, one for Professor K. L. Chopra just a couple of days ago, and before that for Professor D. S. Kothari. Uh, you know all the great men, and I, I was thinking. What is the purpose of a memorial lecture? Now, it could mean different things to different people. Of course, obvious thing is that we pay respect. We pay tribute uh, to the memory uh, of such a great man uh, and that we um, uh, basically uh, recognize this as a role model, uh, which may inspire others. Uh, second is, of course, to examine the life and works of such a great man. Uh, and then see uh, not only what he did, but how he did it. Uh, now, why do we need to examine how he did it? Uh, is because that's something little universal. It does not depend on which area of science I work in, uh, but these are processes of doing science. Uh, and so therefore, they are of value to each one of us. Uh, if you were to talk only about a particular kind of glass, uh, then there would be of limited interest to other people who work deeply in that area, and which is why we have all these uh, focused conferences and workshops to actually exchange those ideas. Uh, but uh, more importantly, uh, it is about examining the mind of that person, uh, the constraints that existed at that time, and what are the lessons that we can draw from it uh, as how they are actually relevant. Uh, for people who work today, which is all of us. So these are several different um, uh, objectives, if you would, of a memorial lecture, uh, which is different from a lecture in the deep vertical of a particular area. So what I would say then is that uh, there's a reason I refrain from getting slides here, uh, is uh, then you know we get focused on slides and I get focused on slides and I keep looking at what's on the slide and I need to explain that. Uh, but on the other hand, let us have a free-flowing conversation about what we think is happening in science, 
Uh, where do we think that the larger processes of science are going? Uh, what is it that we can learn from the past? And what is it that we can extrapolate to the future? Uh, so these are basically, uh, you know, some of the themes as they come to my mind uh, that I would like to share with you. Um, so uh, let's look at actually uh, Dr. Atma Ram and what he did. Uh, of course, so how do we learn about that? Unfortunately, I have not had the, uh, the privilege of meeting him uh, or to knowing him firsthand uh, about, you know, uh, unlike uh, many other people uh, that Unfortunately, he was an early pioneer. Well, fortunately, but unfortunately, having lived uh, before the time that I and many of the people here today started their science. Uh, so, uh, so therefore, what do we do? Well, I go to Google Guru like everybody else, uh, and then I try to look at what were the real elements of his life, uh, which uh, you know give us some hint. They give us some clue, some message. So he were to begin with, of course, uh, technology. Uh, so he produced optical glass, and not only he 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 could uh, fabricate optical glass, which is uh, so uh, so important and used everywhere in almost everything. Uh, but he also oversaw the production of it in sufficient quantities to meet the demands of the country at that time. And once you have the base, one can build on it as the demand goes up. Uh, he also worked on the technology of foam glass and selenium-free red glass, uh, waste mica for insulating bricks, and there are a few other examples which are very compelling in developing technology of the era that was needed. Uh, he also uh, had contributions of basic nature, uh, which is the constitution of glass and the origin, which is the structure of glass. By the way, there's still a very, very a uh, very, very active area of research, uh, both in physics as in material science. In fact, e even uh, everything about the nature of glassy materials is far from understood. Uh, even the debates about different aspects of whether it is thermodynamic phenomenon or kinetic phenomenon, uh, they still uh, uh, go on. Uh, and so there's a very, very healthy area of research. Uh, then he looked at the origin of color in copper red glass, uh, and that clearly is a problem of optics uh, of light. Uh, he had over 200 publications and 31 patents. Now, you know, okay, it looks like, oh, well, okay, 200 publications, no big deal. But don't forget, today we live in the era of cut and paste. Uh, today we look in the era of summoning any number of papers uh, and, uh, you know, just, uh, just producing all the references uh, hardly anybody reads. Actually, I, I know, I often joke, I say professors don't read. Uh, that, let me tell you a joke, uh, which is something that I thought about. I said, why do we call people, uh, you know, lecturers, readers, professors? So lecturers lecture, readers read, and professors, they profess. I don't know what they profess. They profess their knowledge or ignorance or one or the other, uh, but in any case, uh, professors no longer read or read very little. Uh, okay, we just we become there's a corporatization of research, uh, and so people just don't have time because uh, we are publishing dozens and dozens of papers, and the number of journals keep proliferating. But anyhow, going back to the days of Dr. Atma Ram, the publication business and research indeed were very different. Uh, there were maybe two journals that you needed to read and publish in in those days. Uh, that you would type manuscripts uh, on a manual typewriter, then you would send it out in an envelope by surface or air mail to some foreign office, then you would wait six to eight months for reviews, uh, then you know you would get it back, then you would again work on it, send copies in triplicate, wait another six months, and so on. And don't forget, uh, there were no uh, there was no great deal of research infrastructure uh, in the country. So to build it from the scratch, to be able to do all this, to file patents in the days when you know nobody knew what actually patents actually mean uh, and all that, uh, it is tremendous. And the reason I'm saying this is not one, only because it's tremendous, not only to extol the virtues of that person who was Dr. Atmaram, but to say what are the lessons in it for us? 
I mean, we whole lot of time I complain, I got constraints. And so therefore, I am not able to, uh, you know, operate at my optimal level. This is a complaint one hears every place, every day, every moment of the day, which is fine that we acknowledge our constraints, but we cannot be constrained by them. Uh, so uh, th this is a, a very valuable lesson that I have seen in every, uh, you know, good person's life coming from the past, starting from Raman, starting from J.C. Bose, uh, starting from any of these people who were able to do something uh, despite the constraints. Uh, so while we acknowledge the constraints and we work on them, uh, we cannot take them seriously. We cannot cite them as a reason for non-performance. And that, I think, is the most compelling reason that I time and again uh, encounter uh, by looking at all of this. Of course, he provided scientific leadership. He was director, CGCRI founder, and uh, you know, DG, uh, DG later. Oh, by the way, uh, I found that he took over as DG CSIR on August 22, 22nd, 1966. It so happens that I was born on the same day in 1961. So I, I, you know, what are the odds? One in 365, uh, okay, for that to happen. Uh, so anyhow, it's a small world. You would always find some entanglements and some relationships and so on. He was principal advisor to the PM and the cabinet 77 to 83. Uh, and he was also president INSA 69 to 70, uh, which is the foremost academy. I shouldn't say foremost because they may be members of other academies here. Uh, and they may take it to heart. No, I don't mean that. I just mean, okay, well, INSA is one of the academies of science, and he provided leadership uh, to that academy. Um, and then, um, so he was an institution builder, uh, provided vision and all of that. Now, of course, this is another very compelling uh, lesson. Uh, of course, not for everybody. Okay, it's perfectly all right. Uh, to be a good deep scientist and make contributions in a particular area of science. Nothing absolutely lacking there uh, or just to develop technologies which are useful or to be very good at teaching and mentoring or to be very good at uh, administration or providing, uh, you know, support to other people so they can do their science. All of these are legitimate goals of being a scientist. Uh, however, there are very few people who are able to uh, effortlessly and seamlessly combine all of these dimensions. Uh, and that is very fruitful because often the perspectives and the experiences which are gained in one domain of science, uh, they carry over. Uh, uh, so, for example, as being a DGCSIR, but also being a scientist there for a long time and director, he would actually know. Uh, both the strengths and weaknesses at the grassroots. Uh, not every administration which comes from the top actually would have it. Uh, so uh, it is always good uh, that uh, if a person is willing to do something little extra uh, other than doing his or her science uh, and bring those experiences to bear on uh, the progress of science, uh, that brings a greater value uh, to the science itself and to the people who want to do science. So indeed, he was a visionary ahead of his times, no doubt about it. And this is this is a theme that keeps revisiting. Uh, like I said, anytime you examine uh, the lives of all these scientists, uh, sometimes we call them great scientists, whatever. Uh, okay, it's a theme that keeps coming back that they they looked ahead of their times uh, when things uh, that they did were not very fashionable. Uh, they were not inspired by, okay, okay, this great university in the West or this, uh, you know, other great people and so on, uh, but they charted their own path, you know, 100%, but even if one is, let's say, 20% disruptive uh, and, and injecting new uh, daring ideas, uh, okay, uh, then that's a huge contribution because that's something that people build on uh, in the years to come. So now, uh, look, today, uh, we often keep debating about basic applied technology, production, market, commercialization, education, NEP 2020, administration, effective administration, science management, science leadership, 
we, we just keep on forever debating this. And especially, let's say, in the scientific circle, the debate is often centered on, hey, are you basic or are you applied? Uh, there are a whole lot of hierarchies in science. Uh, we know even within physics, if you do certain kind of physics, certain kind of mathematics, then you would be at the top of the pyramid uh, of that particular thing. Uh, you know, uh, say, oh, oh, you know, this is so fundamental and so on. Now, the, these are the silos of knowledge that we have created in our brains, which is perfectly OK if I need to do some work, I need to know what is it that I'm doing. Uh, but to extrapolate that, to give it a value judgment, to give it some kind of morality, to give it some kind of, uh, you know, uh, OK, what is superior and so on, that is totally, totally counterproductive. And it does not inspire the next generations uh, to set up a single mold. Uh, the whole point in science is that let everybody flourish and do the best that they are good at. OK, so there is not a one size that fits all. And often our debates get trapped uh, into this kind of mindset uh, saying, oh, only this is to be done. I've seen even in IIT so many directors uh, you know, every director would bring in. Uh, I don't have so much direct experience of CSIR. OK, or oh, I've been in RCs or various uh, uh, labs, uh, but that provides very limited uh, deep insights. Uh, so anyhow, I can say in many labs in many uh, academic institutions, you know, the leadership is often has a very strong preference. And they say, hey, only do patents. Hey, only do technology, do basic, do this, do that. This is not healthy. Uh, so basically, a big lab or a big, uh, you know, uh, university should be balanced as a whole, not balanced in every person, not balanced in every activity which is undertaken. So it is, a, it is fine. It's all about finding a balance of all of these things. We call them basic applied technology, education, admin, leadership. It is to find in life, uh, like everything else. It is about finding balance with excellence. So our focus has to be on excellence and not on these words about uh, what is it called? Is it called physics? Is it called chemistry? Is it called biology? It is called, you know, it becomes very complicated very soon because then, you know, you get down to these uh, fragmentation of knowledge, which is so in so small bits today. Uh, I mean, knowledge has been so fragmented that is like shattering of a glass uh, with a big hammer. Uh, and then these pieces fly in all the different directions, uh, which is, uh, you know, to, to break a glass is a very simple process. But to put it back together, it's impossible. Uh, so, so this also happens with the two approaches that we have in research, uh, which is what you may call analysis versus synthesis. Now, analysis is all that we have done all our lives starting from education because it's going from course to course chapter to chapter exam to exam degree to degree a job to job and so on uh, so there is greater and greater analysis and fragmentation of that analysis but if we were to look at look what is it that scientists do uh, scientists actually solve problems uh, so when a problem is posed and any of the real problems actually do not belong to a particular silo of knowledge. Uh, they are not tool centric problems. They are not the problems that can be solved only by physical chemistry, only by organic chemistry, only by condensed matter physics, only by mechanical engineering, but it requires all of them, the tools of these various disciplines uh, to come together rather spontaneously and work with each other. So the whole point is first we do fragmentation, then we are a little bit clueless about how to bring it all together again. Because like I pointed out, uh, there's an anti-entropy process. Uh, to shatter is very easy. To bring it back together, these silos, is so energy intensive that it often does not happen. And we already know that from our experience. Uh, for people to work together, even in the same lab, with a common purpose, without having uh, you know, a whole deal of comp negative competition, uh, very difficult. Uh, to work across uh, the, the different labs, more difficult. Uh, to work across uh, the different domains of knowledge, what is called interdisciplinary, very difficult. 
so all these difficulties are created because our mind is prejudiced i mean it's totally prejudiced i have no hesitation in saying this i have seen so many scientists who are so proud about their uh, you know domain of knowledge to be proud is different uh, from being not proud of other domains and so this healthy respect uh, for others is a prerequisite for synthesis uh, which is uh, often i am afraid from my personal experience it often goes missing now let's look at what are the challenges of research uh, today r and d look india is number 3 in number of papers scientific papers that we publish <clears throat> what does it mean now of course a whole lot of people keep saying oh what does it mean i don't really see this impacting our society what does it mean these papers is it the the end in itself is that the goal of doing our research uh, why is it that all these papers and this deep knowledge that we have does not add up uh does not add up in the sense that we don't clearly see its great impact if we are number 3 in the world okay it means something i mean it means something very big uh, there are no socio economic indicators on which we would be number 3 in the world so it means we have deep strengths uh in in research however that deep strength in research there is some failure in its translating uh into impact on our economy and society so i mean this is fairly clear now we have posed the problem and we said what is it about r and d that needs to be done okay so while we we are producing lot of knowledge in terms of which is reflected in papers uh if we were to look at the quality of this knowledge there is something little bit lagging behind the numbers so while in numbers we may be number 3 in quality is very difficult to judge quality by different yardsticks but whichever way you judge it we may be number 10 to 13 14 uh, globally which means that there is uh, a, there is a divide uh, between quantity and quality which means that we have to be really focus on quality which means that we have to focus on profound which means we have to focus on taking risk uh, right but we may be all quite very risk averse because if i had to work in a particular area of science for 20 years 15 years even uh, then i don't have to think about the next paper i can assure you that before i start the work on a particular project i know what paper is going to come out of it uh, only thing that remains is to put some figures to put some uh, you know data and stuff but basically pretty much one sees the whole road map of this research what it means is it is incremental research what it means is it's not sufficiently disruptive which means it's not taking sufficient amount of risk uh you know is is better to take risk and fail not 100% not for 100% scientist either okay again we will come back to balance everything in life must have balance and swinging to one extreme or other and saying i will have revolution i would destroy everything i am not saying that okay all i am saying is that the stability and continuity have to be balanced with disruption uh, so there is a stability and there is disruption on two sides and how do we actually negotiate uh, this balance between continuity and disruption in research the second aspect of our research especially in academia uh, is uh, the relevance and direction of that research now obviously the relevance and direction of research will not come from inside uh you know no matter how brilliant i am sitting on my lab sitting on my table staring at the screen uh it, it, the relevance and direction of what i am doing uh it does not reside with me it resides with the outside world so therefore our connect with the outside world which provides the direction uh for the research is so so essential and this is the weak interface between knowledge creation and knowledge use so while we are very good at creating knowledge we are not equally good at consuming that knowledge uh and that uh, please remember that consumption of knowledge uh is not only the burden of people who create knowledge while they have good responsibility uh, they have to be proactive in going outside and selling this knowledge at the same time you cannot sell that knowledge if there are no buyers uh, there cannot be a hydrogen bond if there is an electron donor but no electron acceptor Uh, so it, it is like a chemical bond 
Uh, so where are these people who have to use this knowledge? Obviously, these people reside in, to begin with, startups which are picking up steam, MSMEs, industry, and even the government, uh, NGOs, and different societal organizations. So it is all about their, uh, you know, not only uh, knowledge creators being proactive, but also the market being proactive in absorbing all this knowledge. This is a point which is usually not appreciated because I said, look, uh, there is some problem with knowledge creation. As is a problem, there are some problem with knowledge creation, of course, but that is not the bottleneck. I guarantee you that if you had a very clear goal in mind, this is what we need to develop in this much time with these parameters at this cost level, that clarity, that direction would help our scientists uh, bridge the gap. I haven't any doubt about it. And Dr. Shekhar Mande knows about it, how CSIR labs work together in the time of COVID-19 to produce what was needed. Now you can ask the question whether it's diagnostics, the ventilator, whatever, uh, you know, and now people have been working on vaccine, uh, different labs and so on. Our professors in IITs, everybody has been working on it. Whole point is they could have done all of this five years ago or even 10 years ago, there's nothing that was preventing this to happen, right? It's just that, okay, when the thing strikes, uh, we say, hey, we have to do something very, very quickly, uh, and then everybody wakes up, but the whole point is they can deliver. So what it means is that, look, there is capacity and capability to deliver as long as there is a shared purpose. And the goal is very clear, and it is clear and present. Of course, it's sometimes clear and present danger, that, of course, you know, uh, stimulates people even more. But I don't mean that we should have danger all the time and one should be working in a war zone all the time. Not that, but it means uh, that we need clear goals and some takers for those goals uh, from the beginning. And this is so important for applied sciences and technology labs like CGCRI. And CGCRI already is an ex. I, I think it's quite extraordinary in this particular aspect. Uh, so all the time that I have known it, uh, that they are fully aware of the fact that while we do good basic research with quality, uh, you know, we also keep in mind our stakeholders uh, and deliver to them. Uh, and this is something that all of us actually need to learn. To be more profound, to take more risks, to be more disruptive, 20-30% uh, of our time and our activities rather than being incremental, because even if one publishes 100 papers being incremental, uh, okay, at the end of that, what remains? Not very much. Uh, I mean, you know, so it's not, and of course, all you see is very interesting. Our promotions, etc., they don't really come, whether, you know, you publish 20 papers or 40 papers or something, right? It's mostly time-bound. And the best of people and the worst of people may have a difference of one or two years in promotions. Uh, OK, so it is not that sensitive. So we don't do this stuff for promotions. What we do this stuff for is basically getting that excitement of doing work, uh, being fully charged. And therefore, when, you know, when one is fully charged, one is not worried about how many papers will get published. What one is worried about is, you know, is it, you know, producing something novel? Is it producing something exciting? Is it pointing out to something which was not known before? Is it making a produce a product or a technology uh, that would serve a very large number of people? Uh, and so this is about, uh, you know, next uh, maybe, uh, looks like I've been speaking too much and I'll run out of time very soon. Uh, but anyhow, uh, uh, you know, le let me just go through a few concepts very, very quickly and about which uh, there are many misunderstandings. Uh, in scientific community, uh, which is okay, but they hold us back. Okay, those misunderstandings have implications in holding us back uh, in realizing our full potential. Uh, and so, you know, uh, people talk about, hey, be creative. What is creativity? Uh, you know, the creativity today has a different meaning than the creativity 100 years ago. Uh, e equal to mc square will never come back again. A uh, whole lot of what you would call creative today uh, is to uh, to connect uh, the silos of knowledge which have not been connected before. Connect them in a meaningful way. 
uh, and derive some usefulness out of that connection. Uh, so, uh, you know, whether it is social science, these are dots of knowledge or which are evolving in isolation from each other. Uh, when, once we get the perspective from one of these and enhance it and modify according to context of another silo, then you get a new perspective altogether. And whole lot of what we call creativity today is actually that. Uh, of course, with the rise of uh, what you call intelligent machines, uh, which is one, I would say, the foremost challenge of the future of technology and science, uh, together with climate change and sustainable development. If I were to define three major challenges of future, which are going to affect every aspect of science and technology that we do, these challenges are rise of intelligent machines, um, sustainable development and climate change. Uh, and there is no getting away from any of this. Science and technology would be some of the strong pillars uh, based on which that we would have to fight uh, these challenges. Now, the only reason that we are not, we are a little complacent about these challenges is because some of them are slow moving, but that uh, is only uh, you know an illusion uh, because a whole lot of processes look linear with a small slope for, for, for a small amount of time until they become exponential. And once they become exponential, there is not sufficient time to deal with them. There is a point of no return. Uh, if you were to look at the curve for the second wave of pandemic, uh, that would actually illustrate to you uh, as to what really happens uh, when you know uh, one is not mentally and otherwise prepared for things. Uh, so there is something about exponential processes uh, of science and technology and the technologies themselves becoming exponential. Now, you see, we talked about the fact that there, is, uh, there are two, two approaches to research, the tool-centric research and the problem-centric research. The problem-centric research has certain, uh, this is, of course, meaningful research, the problem-centric research, uh, and it has certain hallmarks. The hallmarks are that it relies more on synthesis, than on analysis. Uh, it uh, relies more on cooperation than on competition. It relies more on interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary nature than on working in silos of knowledge. Now, this is very interesting about, you know, hold this talk about uh, disciplinary versus interdisciplinary versus multidisciplinary versus new terms now out of discipline, transdisciplinary and so on. And I kept thinking for half an hour about why do we have so many terms floating around? Of course, they look all very nice when I say it. I mean, people, you know, would get suitably impressed if you were to say, hey, let's do interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, out of disciplinary, uh, transdisciplinary. I, I am afraid all of this is actually a huge misunderstanding. It's a huge misunderstanding because the whole question of being multidisciplinary comes because we first created disciplines, we fragmented knowledge like a shattered glass, and now we are trying to put it together. Uh, so uh, if there were no concept, I mean, of course, one need disciplinary. I, I'm not dismissing it. I, I'm not a fool. Right? I'm not stupid. Okay, I'm not, you know, dismissing any of it. It has it has a particular role to play. The di the role of defining discipline in a watertight way and evolving very slowly uh, with it. Uh, it, it, it. Mostly it came in response to undergraduate teaching, which means that I need a certificate, I have done certain kind of courses, some skills, so I can find a job in this particular industry. Okay, and they don't have to look further about my intelligence, but they need to look at my degree. Uh, okay, so it has a purpose in terms of education. Uh, you know, to good delivery of education, uh, effective delivery of education, but to extrapolate it for problem solving, to extrapolate the concept of discipline uh, and take it very seriously, that's a huge mistake. Uh, so actually every problem by definition is multidisciplinary. Uh, and so it's no point, actually the concept of discipline comes after the concept of multidisciplinary. It is not that disciplines come first and then it becomes multidisciplinary. Multidisciplinary is the base of the pyramid of knowledge. And, you know, uh, sooner we recognize that fact, uh, better it would be for our research and development and everything else. Uh, other thing that I already touched upon it, 
that often we complain about the lack of resources, the lack of support. Uh, often we even say, I used to say it, I say, you know, I'm not able to do anything. The director is so bad, right? Uh, so when uh, we are younger, we are criticizing older people. And now that we are older, we criticize the younger people. The criticism remains a constant. Uh, and this sense of frustration and this sense of not having enough, that remains a constant in our lives, the lives of uh, scientists in general. Uh, so this is, you know, it serves no uh, no positive purpose at all. Okay, resources is what we have. We should improve them and we should work very hard on improving them. Uh, and we should work doubly hard to improve them for the next generation of scientists. Uh, it's no point, you know, saying, hey, I lived in such and such days when there was nothing, so you should also do the same. That would be an error uh, to say uh, something like that. But also we must remember, you know, when I'm looking at, I read the whole uh, book on C.V. Raman and J.C. Bose. You see, resource crunch was horrible in those days. There was no connectivity. You don't even have people to talk to. Okay, so you are just totally, what is it that you rely on? You rely on the sparkle of ideas. You rely on the brilliance of ideas, uh, daring ideas. And most of all, one relies on the passion and will. So without uh, this twin uh, aspects of having passion and will, no matter how many resources would be pumped into anything, it would not actually produce quality signs. I am convinced about that. So uh, while uh, one should, of course, pile on resources, no doubt about it, whatever is required, okay, to do that particular work is required, no doubt about it, is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Uh, so uh, how do we bring that passion, that will, and how does that passion and will get dissipated uh, for us scientists who are working very hard in the lab, right? So part of it is, uh, part of it is has to do with, um, you know, the, the petty politics uh, that goes on in every group and every lab. And this is so, so counterproductive to doing good science. I can't emphasize it enough. Uh, I often tell my students and everybody in convocations, the first thing you should do is totally lose the energy vampires. This is a term that I have coined myself. Okay, no matter how hard the life looks, uh, if you get in with energy vampires, uh, for them, the whole world is so bad that you would be left with no energy to do any work at all. Uh, okay, so, uh, so uh, it is about saying, look, things are a little bit not optimal right now. I am working to make them optimal, uh, but you know whatever it is, this is uh, the world is never going to be ideal. Uh, this is a world that I have to work with and deliver, uh, and it helps if we don't get into petty politics. It helps uh, if we don't just take pleasure in criticizing everything that happens and everybody who is around us, because it does not affect them. It affects me when I get into it. That mental state. Uh, which is not very conducive for doing top rated uh, creative work uh, in science. Okay, so uh, another uh, very, uh, very simple concept is about being a leader versus being a follower and it boils down to being profound versus being incremental. We need to have that confidence to be a leader. Okay, uh, there are two ways that, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the communication or transmission of knowledge happens. The model in East is to sit at the feet of your guru or master. The model in the West uh, is to stand on his shoulders. Now it looks like that these are two different processes, but they actually are not. So when you want to really learn state of the art, it has to be transmitted from other people who know this. And this is like sitting at the feet. But when you want to see beyond what other people know, right, which is called search, I don't know why it's called research because research means uh, re researching. Okay, searching for what has already been searched. Okay, so that can be a joke. But uh, basically, to look beyond and have that confidence to look beyond, it also means it, it has a cultural dimension. The cultural dimension is uh, that we must have a healthy sense of irreverence uh, for all ideas. I'm not saying irreverence for people. Of course, we shouldn't be, you know. Uh, uh, doing puja of our machines and people, no matter you know what their ranks are. Okay, we, we should give them healthy respect, but not worship. 
okay not be so greatly influenced that i should be doing everything like this guy okay that's not your own path so um uh, so there has to be a healthy irreverence about ideas critical examination of ideas shoot them down if you have to and that culture that uh, somebody can talk to his or her boss very frankly without hiding anything okay but without any ulterior motive uh, that should be totally totally encouraged in every system uh, so it basically means being independent in your ideas even if they are wrong it is okay to have wrong idea there is no such thing as wrong idea just as there is no such thing as wrong experiment there can be a wrong theory but never a wrong experiment so it is all about understanding is about you know examining things critically in fact that's the first principle of doing science and it's not new and not only science it is a first principle of doing anything rational of doing anything uh, which needs to be done with a particular goal and effectiveness what is that first principle uh, and it was said first in fact by none other than buddha 2500 years ago he said believe no one believe nothing not not no one is a believe nothing no matter who said it no matter if i said it unless you have examined it critically and it harmonizes with your own experience and reasoning very profound so sometimes we think oh science is only 200 years old but the processes of science are very ancient whether it is uh, you know uh, sankhya whether it is this all systems of philosophy basically uh, converge on being rationality on logic uh, in, in fact uh, the the logic at the time of mahayana school uh, for example nagarjuna for example the mool madhyam karika of nagarjuna it is such a rich text even today because you see the modern science started with what is called boolean logic uh, or what you call you know the binary logic of yes and no but you see the logic of life a little bit different uh, it is never about yes and no because we say yes and no simultaneously to everything there are certain aspects that we say no there are certain aspects that we say yes and to negotiate that logic it is not actually in modern mind but it was there in the ancient mind and you can learn a lot uh, from that uh, so okay uh, so probably the final thing that i would take up is uh, the stuff about innovation innovation has become a buzzword last uh, you know especially 10 years or so uh, in fact i remember in uh, pro- being a professor in iit uh, we didn't worry about patenting we didn't worry about startups and all that stuff until i would say about 10 15 years ago was the beginning of it now uh, in fact there was a committee uh, constituted by csir of which i was a member uh, maybe 10 years ago or more Uh, which were talking about making a shanti swarup bhatnagar award in innovation we had several meetings nobody could converge on the meaning of innovation and nobody could converge on how we would quantify it okay and so therefore i think there is still no bhatnagar award in innovation but it is so much needed so if our friend i mean uh, dg csir is there uh, he may wish to resurrect this Uh, and i will totally help you i will quantify it for you and now since then those 10 years i have been thinking very hard about it and i am saying in fact innovation can be it can be quantified even more easily than invention i have any doubt about it of course for invention we count the number of papers then citations uh, then impact factors then h index i index whatever h square index so everything becomes like a little bit mechanical but i guarantee you innovation is even easier to judge okay and how is that look there are two these processes of invention and innovation much of our work goes into invention uh, right and invention basically is a black box uh, in which the resources come in and knowledge comes out innovation is opposite black box uh, 180 degree out of phase with invention Uh, so in innovation black box the knowledge comes in and money flows out okay money is a crude way to put it okay i mean uh, it produces new socio economic opportunities so innovation is using knowledge to produce new opportunities economic opportunities social opportunities and so on whereas invention takes resources to produce 
right? And so much of our academia, R&D labs, etc., they actually are invention mode, which is to generate knowledge. But uh, you see the circle of knowledge, the sustainability of knowledge, the, the completing the circle of knowledge depends on joining these two halves. Invention, one half of the circle of knowledge, innovation, another half of the circle of knowledge. So basically, there's a continuous production of knowledge and resources, and those resources go into producing new knowledge. It's very simple. And of course, if, if the same person cannot do it all. It may be even as uh, the same institution, organization cannot do it all, which is why it is so, so necessary to work together. Uh, and so I said, I, I promise that you can quantify innovation. So it's very simple then, you know, you just look at what was the, uh, the output, uh, right? So innovation is only about output, okay? It is not about a great idea. The great ideas you cannot judge. It is about the impact that that great idea has produced. And that impact, very easy to translate in terms of rupees. Even if it enhances, let us say, the, the longevity of your life, there, there is a way to translate all of this into e impact on economy. Okay, whether it is your health, whether it is your education, whether it is our, uh, you know, any of these parameters basically are intimately related uh, to the economic indicators. Uh, and so therefore innovation, which is the impact of idea, is very easy to judge. Uh, often we confuse innovation by saying, hey, Sergi, what an innovative idea and probably he is thinking about a very brilliant idea. But innovation is not about brilliant idea. Brilliant idea have a role, very compelling role, but that's not what innovation is. I'm going to write something on this. Anyway, uh, final thing is, look, uh, today there's an explosion of knowledge. Uh, actually, not explosion of knowledge, but explosion of data, information, and so on. Nobody can keep track of all of this anymore. No single mind can keep track of it. So what is it that we do with all this data? Uh, this is about the pyramid of knowledge. The data comes at the base of that pyramid. From that, you uh, would distill some information which is useful. From that information, one would distill knowledge, which is a framework to interpret information, which means that when encounters another piece of information, how does it actually fits into the larger view uh, of science? Then knowledge and hope is that eventually one distills from knowledge, some amount of wisdom and control, uh, which is what is called innovation. So, uh, okay, innovation is not a single event, it's a chain of things. Uh, and so any program that, uh, that addresses innovation must take into account the fact that one requires training, training, mentoring, motivation, uh, pre-incubation activities like good prototyping, uh, good pre-incubation activities like understanding of market, uh, understanding of competitors and the business plans. Uh, then uh, to raise money for it, to have money for all of this uh, and to have seed grant. And very importantly, to be ability to work with people who are not like yourself. Whole lot of startups fail. I've talked to so many people. Whole lot of them fail at the end, not in the beginning. They have very good idea. Okay, but they somehow thought that the idea is what makes money. And uh, nothing could be farther from truth. Uh, okay, what makes money actually is understanding of market and selling. And that comes not from the scientist who has a great idea. So therefore, no matter how much I do not like MBA people, uh, you, I, I must have the capacity to understand uh, what it actually means and how to harness that particular aspect uh, to be, you know, take my uh, stuff forward. Um, I, I think we are quite out of time. Uh, so maybe just uh, two more minutes to say how we actually translate some of this into action. I will give one example. That one example is uh, a new a mission on cyber physical systems that DST launched uh, uh, last year. Uh, and so the whole, uh, the, the, the structure of that mission is a complete departure from the past. Uh, the mission is worth about 3,600 crores and it has set up 25 hubs in different themes. Each theme, each hub uh, is of course autonomous section eight company and they are given delegated all the powers, administrative and financial powers, which means that they are arms length from the government. Uh, second aspect is that each of these hub is not just a geographic entity. 
it is a thematic entity and so what it means is that they are responsible for developing that particular area in the entire country by giving grants by taking grants by bringing in industry by giving money to industry taking money from industry by working with ministries by doing all of that so there has to be somebody who is an aggregator and custodian of knowledge in a particular area we cannot fragment it and moreover that the, the fragmentation which is in terms of basic science applied science technology startup uh, this industry all of that has to be integrated in the same hub so therefore it is not oh, while well, you will do basic research i will do applied research you will do this that no all of this actually has to work together in parallel uh, and often together with other people so uh, this is a very compelling model for technology missions of the future uh, and there is another one in quantum technologies which is now ready uh, which is 8000 crores worth uh, should follow the similar architecture structure and processes including also another one which is from earth sciences which is a deep ocean mission uh, right uh, going down in the ocean and looking at that but all i'm saying is look we must understand the the structure and processes of doing science much better than the way we have been doing them it is not about the content of science okay it's not about oh should i do this glass and of course that will all get done right but uh, what is it that's holding us back uh, in order to be able to do great things uh, for which indeed uh, you know there is uh, uh, so in no i said another major challenge of the future is climate change and sustainable development just uh, all of these problems which are of course uh, you know problems which are huge huge requires huge huge teams people to work together with different angles and perspectives and of course it's not only science and technology that would address these problems of course there are rules regulations laws policies but don't forget there are deep cultural aspects the deep cultural aspects of society for example related to greed apathy self centeredness at every scale from individual scale to society to nations to global scale these are the cultural very deep cultural issues uh, which would hamper progress uh, in all of these uh, areas okay so really really now i would conclude uh, so we are talking about dr atmaram and so that brings to my mind also the word atmanirbhar uh, so now we are talking been talking about atmanirbhar a lot Uh, and dr atmaram in fact is a, a forerunner a pioneer i would say of that concept uh, both in the theory and practice right so i just want to conclude by saying uh, that atmanirbharta of course is science technology and innovation pillars uh, or components but to my mind the deepest component of atmanirbharta is cultural okay and what are those cultural aspects uh, you see whole lot of cultures they say hey you may be stupid but don't be humble okay we are other way around actually uh, i ask the top you know intelligent people who have cracked 10 exams in their world, uh, their, their life but they are still not confident i mean they are not sure they think that is because of books that they mugged up that they cracked these exams not because of their intelligence so atmanirbharta depends on atmavishwas and atmavishwas is the is the ability the capacity to say look no matter what happens i i am going to address this problem okay uh, in the long term i may fail but that's not the point atmavishwas is the the meaning of that uh, is my ability to understand and address problems and have reasonable confidence to solve them okay uh, and with that positivity that atmavishwas as a societal uh, characteristic Uh, is so very very important and we have all seen uh, this in in practice in operation uh, in motion as to how we are not as successful as we could be the same guy when transplanted somewhere else abroad here on a multinational company is totally delivering right uh, so uh, that that's one aspect uh, the second aspect of atmanirbharta is atma samman and atma samman is not exclusive to a person uh, in fact a person who does not respect himself or herself cannot give that respect to others i am convinced about it all these people are going yak yak criticizing everybody actually they lack atma samman 
Okay, it, it's not because uh, it is because uh, you know they have Atma Samman and because of that they are you know putting you down. Uh, you, you see, if, if we have a self-respect, we understand the same thing in others. Uh, and finally, Atma Chintan. So Atma Nirbhata depends on Atma Chintan, which is not Chinta, uh, but Chintan is a dispassionate, rational, logical, scientific analysis of who we are, where we are, and where we need to be, and how. Uh, so this Atma Chintan, very necessary, and it also rhymes with uh, Chintamani, uh, who is with us. So Chintamani means, uh, you know, the top of uh, Chintan person. Isn't it? Money is jam. So uh, a jam who is doing Chintan all the time, very happy to have Chintamani here, no doubt. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so I totally conclude here, and I, I, I think I've gone overboard, taken, um, I don't know how much extra time. But thank you very much uh, for your patience um, all this time. Thank you. And of course, to CGCRI, I wish all the very best going forward. I haven't any doubt uh, that they would continue to excel uh, and continue to put out lots of great, disruptive, game-changing, pole vaulting ideas. Uh, as your previous DG, uh, Mashelkar, is very fond of saying, let's go from frog, uh, uh, leapfrogging to pole vaulting. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sharma. Thank you for the elaborate insight. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would now request our director, Madam, to kindly showcase our small token of appreciation meant for our chief guest. Many thanks, Professor Sharma, for such an interesting and illuminating lecture. Probably you touched each one's heart. That was the most uh, uh, important in this lecture I could find that uh, probably everybody will say that, yes, I also went through this. Yeah, I was also probably sometimes criticized and I uh, director did not follow me. And we all complained in our life, but we, uh, everyone has to work. That message was so well given. Really very much thankful to you. Your points raised, that is excellence in whatever we do is very important. Wherever we are, we should try our best to have uh, excellence in our work. And so that it's another very important thing that doing the relevant things so that it helps others, it helps the nation and in the, as a whole to the world. I personally very much like the way you everything connected spiritually as well as uh, scientifically. Innovation is very important for innovation. We have taken in your points that such kind of uh, involvement must be there in the lab so that they are encouraged. I as a director and as also shall see that such environment I should be able to bring if it is does not exist in some corners. Many thanks, many, many thanks. I have no words really which I can express you in by my words. Once again, thank you. As a as a part of today's lecture, as Atma Ram Memorial Memorial Lecture, CGCRI with lot of love, respect and appreciation for your deliverance of Atma Ram Memorial Lecture. Presents to you Atma Ram Memorial, Le Memorial Lecture, Memorialia. It consists of a silver plate. I request you to kindly accept it virtually, please, today. I'm very you, happy sir. to accept it, and I this hope it's not only virtual that it would get to my office someday. Yeah, this, this will be. Uh, it will be handed over to you soon at, at your office. Thank you very much, sir. I'm very much thanked. Thank you so much, Martin. It's time now, now to acknowledge the efforts of all those without whose active participation this program wouldn't have been possible. And to do the honor, I would call upon my colleague, Mr. Siddharth Day, the administrative officer, to deliver the vote of thanks, please. A very good morning to everyone. Uh, I deem it a great honor and privilege uh, to propose a vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. On behalf of CDCRI, I extend my gratitude uh, to our honorable chief guest, Professor Ashutosh Sharma, Secretary, Department of Science and Technology and Earth Sciences, uh, for taking time of your, out of your busy schedule and for gracing this occasion and for delivering the Atma Ram Memorial Lecture. So your lecture was just absolutely amazing. I mean, it transcended into so many areas 
from modern designs to uh, ancient history to philosophical thoughts. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. Uh, thanks, sir, for sharing your insights. It's also showed us paved a pathway for pursuit of science in the future as well. It was absolutely amazing, sir. Uh, thank you for inspiring and encouraging us on this very special occasion. Thank you very much, Professor Sharma. Uh, we are grateful to our Director General, Dr. Shekhar Si Mande, uh, Secretary DSIR, for delivering the presidential address and for his encouragement. So your able guidance uh, has always encouraged us. I thank you for your kindness, your interest, uh, your hospitality and your continued support. Thank you so much, sir. I thank our director, uh, Dr. Suman Kumari Mishra for her unstinted support, stewardship, vision and commitment. Uh, Madam, the success of this event owes a lot to your leadership abilities. Uh, thank you so much. My heartfelt thanks uh, to Dr. Sanyal and to all heads of divisions and scientists for their valuable contribution, guidance and encouragement to all of us. I owe special gratitude to all the officials and students who have worked hard to make this event happen. Uh, once again, I thank all the invitees, participants and everyone who has joined us for your cooperation in making this event a resounding success. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you, Siddharth. With this, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our today's program. Thank you so much for being a part of this journey. May I now request all of you to kindly rise for the national anthem. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Sarma. Thank you, Professor Monday.